status check to proceed with terminal count. First aid system. Propulsion. Go. Hydraulic. Go. Locks. Go. LH2. Go. Vehicle system engine. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. You have permission to launch. We have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance. Liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket. And we have good indication of separation. Hello, I'm Rhonda Stevenson, and welcome to Space Matters. I'm so excited to share with you today our discussion with Story Musgrave, astronaut, philosopher, author, doctor, the list goes on and on. So without further ado, please welcome Story Musgrave. <laughs> Hi, Story, how are you doing yeah, today? And don't, don't forget Daddy. That's right. Do daddy. not forget I'm a daddy. And that's, <laughs> that's capitalist daddy. He's a daddy. <laughs> I, I, I love it when you, you, you tell us about your kids. Um, uh, how, how old is your oldest and how young is your youngest? And it's 62 to 14 so far. 62 to 14. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, I, I'd be excited to know if there were any more on the way. I love kids. Oh. Um, <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you. However. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. I won't tell you but I can't say no. <laughs> All right. So um, I, again, I just want to express how uh, exciting it is to have you with us today. And you, you, you've spoken often about your journey from being born on a dairy farm and, you know, being able to go into the, the forest with, at three and craft your own raft at five and, and, and that kind of experience. How did that shape the decisions that you made moving forward? <clears throat> so um, people talk about the transcendent experience and uh, the out of the world experience and that you have in space flight. Believe me, Rhonda, the most powerful world I ever knew was age three in the forest alone at night. That is far, far out. If you look at a three-year-old who entered the forest, not worried about getting lost, which happened now and then, but I could navigate somewhat by simply reversing what I see in the sky with the stars, but I could also put my hand on the, on the moss, on the tree. So in, a, in, a, in New England, in Western Massachusetts, of course, the north side of the tree had never seen the sun. And so uh, the bark, the bark feels very different on the north side, but I would navigate by simply reversing my feel of the bark on the way out. If I got lost, I just go to sleep by there and, uh, and pick it up in the daytime. But for a three-year-old to have the faith that whatever is out there will not only not hurt me, but will look after me. And the faith in the heavens and the faith in that whole process I just want to say that that is further out than anything I ever did in space. So and was it's that, fair, fair for anybody. Was that an experience that then, you know, enabled you to move forward and learn how to make rafts at five? Yes. And put them out on your own? Yeah. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And obviously um, you had some mechanics abilities uh, moving forward into becoming a mechanic. Yeah, I had to, and I had a mom that somehow had the faith all this is going to work out. <laughs> what was, um, what was it that motivated you to join the Marines? Um, well, as I uh, said, I, um, my farm went broke. And so uh, I left school and I became a heavy construction equipment mechanic. We finished building a Massachusetts Turnpike and now so I don't have high school and I'm out of a job. And this was just the greatest opportunity. It was just sitting around. It was just a huge opportunity. And of course, uh, they had the spirit. I didn't know anything. I joined the Marines at 16. I lied about my age. And um, 
the Marines, it's, I'm a simple-minded farm kid. It's not like, uh, you know, the government's not going to, doesn't know where or when you were born. The paperwork caught up and they said, Private Musgrave, you're lying on government forms at the age of 16. That's not a good start. But, sir, we still love it. Just come back when you're 17. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it was, uh, for where I was, it was a perfect opportunity and you simply see the path. But but it's, it's I don't know where this is going. It's just, I need a step now. I need to do something now. And so, I can yeah. join the Marines without high school. And, you know, and there's, there's opportunity. So, I don't know where that's going. I got no idea. It's the, it, it's the next step. It's just grabbing something. But look at the path, and my goodness, did it work out? The, it, yeah, it, was, it worked out. What's um? How did you in the Marines? How did you go from mechanic to pilot? I didn't fly with the Marines. I couldn't without an education. Okay. I flew in the right seat, called a forward air controller or air oh. ground coordinator. So I couldn't fly without high school. And then did that lead to becoming a parachutist right away? Or how did that evolve? <laughs> That's nuts. I'm in medical school at Columbia, you know, across the river, across the Hudson in Manhattan. <clears throat> and I heard that they were falling out of airplanes. Now, this is brand new. The sport was not in the United States. It came from France in 1961 <clears throat> but that was a very strange idea to me because we weren't free falling no one's doing that but this idea of falling out of airplanes uh, was very appealing to me and so i said we better go look into whatever they're doing across the hudson river lakewood sport parachuting center lakewood new jersey but it's very important to say <clears throat> that when i went there i took my whole family with me you cannot possibly be in medical school with kids and a family and say, I'm going to go fall out of airplanes. That is not a sensible thing to do. And so I went to medical school and, uh, you know, life happens. I had no children when I entered medical school, but until I took OBGYN courses and found out where kids came from, they were popping out every spring. And so there was, uh, we had no kids when we went to Columbia, but we left with four of them. So you see how life happens. <laughs> but this was the most marvelous thing, Rhonda. We had a gorgeous time in, in New York City. And Columbia is the most outrageously beautiful uh, medical school. And 100% of everything I did was right. It was just beautiful. So between Columbia and all these young kids and doing stuff. But so I took that whole brood, some of them not even a year yet. I took them out and they, uh, they didn't go parachuting with me, of course, but they participated in all the studies. They went to all the classes. And when I jump out of an airplane, they are there next to my instructor who's talking to me in a helmet. And they're there and I come them down. <clears throat> And I land right next to them. So the family had total faith in this person is not going to allow anything bad to happen. They had the faith that he does the details. And so, but there, see, at the early stage, I'm doing the details. And so that was my bachelor's degree. Complex uh, calculus and multivariate statistics. Due to factors are going to affect your outcome and it, you can guarantee the outcome. So, and your, and your medical degree, what else is driving you at this point to, to keep pushing your curiosity? I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> no, I don't know who I am and I don't know where I came from. Well, you have said that. I don't know uh, where I came from. Curiosity is never alone. Uh, imagination always goes with it. And it I guess I'm wondering, what were you imagining for yourself as you're going through these uh, experiences? Are you headed to Alpha Centauri yet? Or uh, what does that look like? Uh, no, I wasn't in there yet. In fact, uh, space came much later in this entire enterprise. So as you well know, the earliest astronauts had to be military pilots of which, uh, military test pilots of which I was not. And so <clears throat> that was a, 
That was something of interest, but it's nothing I can do. The door is shut. I can't do that. So, but during my surgical training, I'm heading for neurosurgery. That's brain stuff, of course. And during my surgical training, <clears throat> National Academy of Science and NASA were putting their heads together about flying formerly trained scientists in space to get a bigger return from space flight. And I said, my goodness, leave me alone. I'm trying to grow up. I'm trying to stay with something. You don't know. That's me. So I went there, you see. Uh, I know National Academy is not looking for more clinical training. No, they're looking for science. So at that point, I left my clinical training and went into um, postdoc fellowship and another degree in biological physics. So I'm just, you know, it's the next step. And so I add education to the next step. <clears throat> So when you then NASA that they are looking for mission flight specialists, <clears throat> and then the door opens. And of course, it, as you know, it wasn't mission specialists; it was scientists, astronauts. They hadn't invented yet the category mission specialist. And then you applied. Yeah. <clears throat> And, and six six thousand of us applied. Six thousand, everyone had doctorates, done research, and out of those six thousand, six of us got to space. So those are not good odds. <laughs> with the the many degrees <clears throat> that that you have, and with the education that you had pursued up to that point, what which one do you think was the most um, influential that uh, got you in the doors of NASA? Well, I didn't have my humanities in my literature and all that yet. So at that point, I don't know what they considered, uh, you know, maybe the MD or maybe the biological physics. But for me, as I said earlier, the number one thing who I am is do the details, you're going to die. And so the factors, I know it's boring. I know it's boring. I don't care. Everyone that's listening to this program, wherever you want to go in life, whatever project you want to run, whatever program you're into, you must identify and control those elements of that thing which are going to stop you from getting there or which are going to help you get there. And so I guess I still look upon that, um, you know, my bachelor's in multivariate statistics and uh, Calculus of complex variables, that sounds terrible for a 20-year-old farm kid, you know, but I loved every second of it. Well, by the time, <laughs> by the time yeah. remember, you can fix anything, you can do anything, you can work and fix people. Uh, you were so versatile. And um, I had read, and if you could clarify for me, uh, I had read that you had actually spent some time with uh, – the development of Hubble before it ever went up. <clears throat> I spent 18 years with Hubble before it had a name, before it had a contractor. Way back in 1975, we are going to put a big telescope in space, you know, Pritzker, uh, Princeton. And so uh, we know that's coming. But NASA very early on, way back in 75, uh, had me, the only astronaut on the team, a part of that team, Hey, we're going to do this, and this will be the first satellite we've ever put up, which is designed ahead of time to be fixed by a spacewalk. So, story, you identify every possible failure it can get into and what you're going to do about it. So, there's thousands of pages, procedures, and tests, and thinking. It's details, you know. So, 18 years. So, to the extent I had to, I designed Hubble. If I can't reach a component, we can't put the component there. If I can't run mirrors around the corners, we can't do that. And so I'm trying not to influence. I'm trying not to inhibit the design to the extent I can, but there's some jobs I cannot get done with the current design. So the design got to bend a little bit to meet a spacewalker to get that job done. And of course, along the way, I did not plan on us putting the wrong mirror in the telescope. That was a surprise. I should have been cynical enough along the way, identify all the things that can happen to you. <laughs> I didn't plan on that one. So you've been on uh, six shuttle missions. 
What was your favorite? <clears throat> the one that, that you enjoyed the most? Um, uh, we don't want to forget I was a backup crew, and a backup crew in the old days meant you were 100% trained. You were in Florida. You were waiting, and when the person you're backing up, even going to the pad, if they fall down on the job, they throw you in. So you are 100% trained, and that was the mission in which I had to put the most into it. That was three years of training for Skylab 1. That was our first space station and flying on a Saturn 1B Apollo, <clears throat> Saturn 1B to go to Skylab. And so even though I didn't fly, I was a backup on that one. That means a, a huge amount to me. And it took really more effort than training for any of the other missions. But so on uh, the shuttle missions, um, I'm best known for a lead mechanic to fix humble, but maybe my second one, which is all astronomy. I was a pilot on that one. And so I can fly as a pilot or I can fly as a scientist, whatever you want in life. But my function there was to fly engineer going up and coming down. And I was a pilot on board. So we were running uh, astronomy uh, 24 hours a day. And I had my eight hour shift uh, to run the shuttle while we're doing astronomy. Four ultraviolet telescopes, a cosmic ray telescope, an infrared telescope. Um, we had every kind of thing. Uh, every kind of telescope on board. We released a satellite, flew around it to get the electromagnetics of the earth and all the rest of that stuff. I guess I got as much affection for that one as, as, as Hubble. But of course, um, SDS-6, Challenger's first flight was Challenger's first flight. I designed a spacewalk to get that done because I've been working on a spacesuit, the same one they're using this week. The suit they're using this week, I helped design almost 50 years ago. And so I was very thankful on Challenger's first flight to be able to test uh, this suit that I'd worked on for a dozen years. And so STS-6, Challenger's first flight, and I did the first inertial upper stage and a Tedris deployment. But all in all, if you look at where I peaked out, it may have been uh, called a 51F, an astronomy mission. I um, I really enjoyed reading about the the sleep observation kind of experimentation you were doing and um, in, in folding yourself with the <coughs> spacesuits and kind of having a mental exercise in, in a sleep experience. Yeah, I worked hard on sleep, and it's uh, just. Uh... It's what y'all are about. It's what we're about. And that's uh, moving, moving into the space flight environment, the different environment. And of course, we are biological creatures evolved in four billion years of gravity. And it's a very strange place to be. For me, the stranger it was, the more I loved it. So I was always looking for some experiment. My very first night in space, my buddies, I put their sleeping bags on the floor because that the floor is where, the, where things belong. And it's very interesting that every single uh, geographic, geometric, every architecture we have ever launched in space, only one tiny piece on Skylab did not have a ceiling and floor, a 1G orientation. I think we've locked down doing that. We haven't been creative, but again, it, it gets into all the kinds of things you're doing. But the very first night, my buddies are all sleeping on the floor, and I said, it took me a long time to get into space. I'm going to put it to use. So I put my sleeping bag on the ceiling. I'm going to have some fun up there. But no, as soon as I slept in the bag, the whole world turned around and my buddies are on the ceiling, not me. Because the bag grabbed me, see. You, you, you climb in bed, the bed grabs you. And the, the bed tells you which way is down and which way is up. And that's just the story. Or free fall, there is no up or down. That's physics, folk. I'm talking biology. <laughs> so... So the next night I went head first and after a while I just strapped my belt and uh, it wasn't on my first flight, it was about my second one, I went floating. And so I just dropped myself. Um, dropping yourself is a real art. How you get off of structure is a real art. Because if one finger is touching when you get off of the other is not, it'll impart a force on you. And so to get a perfect drop where you're in the middle of absolutely nowhere, is a, is a real art form. And you may you may be there half an hour. You may be there an hour before you touch anything after that. And so, but it, it is really uh, kind of transcendent. 
So after a while now, you have some motion. So you don't know where Earth is. You could not. You don't know where you are over Earth, and you don't even know where the spaceship is around you. So it's a total loss situation, which I have piles of fun with. You know, and <clears throat> then you lose track of your arms, too, because your arms are in contact with nothing. It's like bed down here, the arms are resting, or any kind of gravity is pulling the extensors or the flexors. It's, it's, it's you know, it's torque. But in, in zero G, everything just hanging. So you lose track of the fact you have arms and that's another dissociation, which is piles of fun. And so you are, you are totally lost. But I had fun, so mission control, and that's a very important thing, mission control. I had 25 missions of mission control. I was your lead communicator, and it's maybe it's more important than what I did in space flight. I was your lead communicator for 25 missions. Nobody came near that. That's how I really learned to be an astronaut. But just to tease him one night, when I'm up there in space, I said, well, I'm heading off for bed, and if you can, don't hit me tonight. <laughs> oh, don't hit me. What's he mean? So the flight director, is at the flight dynamic says, I know what he means. He means when we move the vehicle, don't bump into him. That's what he means. Well, the flight director says, can we do that? He says, no, sir, we can. He may be through the center of gravity in terms of the roll, but pitch. And y'all, he's not in the center of gravity of the vehicle, so we can't do that. We will bump him a little bit, but we can do it gentle. Okay. You have uh, so much experience. Do you ever have the opportunity to participate in the Mirror Mission? <clears throat> I, I, I really wanted to do Mirror because it's multicultural. And I, I was assigned to a crew by the astronaut office. And it never happened. And it should have happened. It should have happened. I should have made it to Mir. I also should have made it back to the telescope another time. Other people did. I should have made it there too, but uh, the bureaucracy of NASA was in failure at that time. That's all. How do you feel that what we're what we had been doing after the end of the shuttle mission and the collaboration with uh using um soyuz rockets to get to the international space station how did mir influence that dynamic i don't know how mir influenced that soyuz has been around for decades and it's doing a heck of a job <clears throat> i just know how to do that the collaborative relationship yeah that's terrific yeah they know how to do it and they've done it for us. So uh, it was time for a shuttle to to finish its job because it had been going for 30 years, but it was not convenient in terms of having a station up there to, you know, to retire the shuttle at that time. Uh, but since we did, uh, Soyuz was our only way to get there, and they have certainly helped out. So as... Um you're going through these missions um, and you had the opportunity to uh, operate the MMU. What was that experience like? I was, I helped design the MMU. So as astronauts between programs, <clears throat> we get assigned to make our contribution, our flying contribution to all the various pieces of hardware. And so, uh, I was the principal person responsible for that, but Bruce McCandless, good old Bruce, took a huge interest in that. And thank goodness he got to fly. So I never got to fly to MMU. And in fact, you know, it only got to fly twice. Okay. But it's a, it's, a, it's a very reasonable thing to do. It's just a jet of fuel. I mean, gas. It's just coal gas. If you squirt gas in that direction, you're going in that direction. <clears throat> and uh, doing spacewalks on space station, uh, we do have a very small kind of MMU if we ever get loose. And so uh, in the shuttle program, you didn't have to worry about getting loose. The shuttle come get you. And I've seen that happen, not with humans, but with tools. You lose a tool, I'll bring it right back to you. But space station, they can't chase after you. So you need this little jet pack uh, below your life support system. So that's the yeah. option of a... Of a yeah. Oh, what? 
I said, so that was an updated version of an MMU. Yeah, but but very small. It's at the it's at the bottom of your life support system, and it's on your back. So it's a very tiny little thing, but it will get you home. So then, after um, all these great missions and all of the contributions that that you've made uh, to NASA and to science and to discovery, what were your next steps after that? Just well, like I said, I didn't want to leave. I was not ready to leave. I was ready to keep flying, and I was totally confident to go flying. And NASA said, we ain't flying you no more, and we don't have a job for you. What? Yes, we are not going to fly you anymore, and we don't have a job for you. What's that say? Out the door. Okay. So um, I went out the door, and um, I have professorships, and so I have companies I work for. I have a couple companies of my own, and I have some very wonderful uh, long-term clients that I get together with to help them invent the future. Where are we going next with you all? And so it's a, it's a long-term set of, of really brilliant clients. It's two jobs, two companies, and two professorships. You, uh, you're a farmer. I am a farmer. I have raised, and I'm so proud of this. I have raised 9,000 palm trees myself alone. Me doing the labor, me doing the equipment, me taking care of those beauties. <clears throat> I'm a farmer. I know how to do that. So I've raised 9,000 palm trees of 40 different species. And I also traveled around the world with a lot of them to find out their native environment so that I could offer them you know, in Florida, what they had in that other country in the world. So again, that relates to the planet. And um, before we get too far, yeah. I didn't want to lose this place. I love your hypothesis. It's one of my favorite things. Um, you have said that curiosity is never alone. Imagination always goes with it. <coughs> and, and I'm... <coughs> I would love to know, and I'm sure others would too. What what do you imagine? What are you curious about? Well, Rhonda, you're, you're you're going someplace, and you don't know what's there. So you're going to be an explorer. And in the mind, now you're going to go explore new territory. It may be geographic, or maybe ideation, maybe philosophy, science. You're going someplace new. What I'm saying is, is you don't just enter into a vacuum and thinking about the new place you're going you have an imagination what builds even though you don't have the data you creatively build what you think you're going to find when you get there that's what i mean by and this is my own hypothesis it's my own thinking you cannot enter a vacuum it's not the way the world works you're going to open this door and jump in. Well, you're not jumping into a vacuum. You mentally, in your imagination, do the ideation of what you expect to find there. That's how imagination uh, precedes, uh, you know, exploration, the unknown. You talked about the many forks in the road, and I'm curious what you, you see as your next fork in the road. <coughs> My next fork in the road, Rhonda, is leaving this planet. What are it's you that crazy? simple. It's that simple, ma'am. We ain't going to run away from it. It's here and it's now. I'm going on 90. My next fork in the road, my next adventure is leaving the planet. People may not want to hear that. It's life. And I'm going to leave the planet and I'm going to leave it right. <laughs> the ultimate space flight? What? The ultimate yeah. space flight? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. So, yeah, you're right. I should put my own words to work. I need to have my imagination as to what, what that world is about out there. I, I, I'm sure that, that you're going to be around for a while. Um, you're tremendously physically fit. Um, 
so this this votes for other but, um, yes but that but but what you said is right but that is not going to allow me to avoid what's going on and to leave mean? and to leave unprepared okay so how are you preparing what does that look like what are you curious about what kind you of wanna, you don't want to hear all that <clears throat> It's, you know, it's simplification of life, uh, clutter, and uh, it's looking after my gang, uh, my seven kids, and uh, cleaning up my act, making it simple, and getting ready so you're not leaving a lot of undone things for other people to try to work out when they have no history and they have no understanding. It's just preparing yourself for the journey. I don't know how many people do that. I, I would like to know, and I'm sure others would as well, um, with regards to imagination and the journey, I, I also know you to be a great communicator with children. And I, I, I'm wondering how that has impacted the influence that you've had working with Disney or how it's impacted you uh, um, and, and what kind of engagements you have to, to the next generation. I love kids and I work with them and I help them explore and I help give them the message we've done here today. It's one tiny little step at a time. Don't worry. Just take the next step. Keep moving. It don't matter where you go because you're not going there. <laughs> hey, man, this this seven, eight year old that's riding the combines. that's in dust so heavy he can't even see his own hands and the bailers were not tied the knots back then. So I'm sitting in all this dust, and if I leave my hands in that machine too long, they're going to be in there forever. The amount of injuries I was going through on a farm are just uh, ridiculous. <clears throat> but um, so you don't know. So that that seven-year-old kid did not know he would be on Tau Zero today. You don't know. Keep it rolling. Keep it rolling. You had Keep said. Yeah. You had said to me at one point that you didn't want a legacy. Would you mind explaining that? Because you've already contributed so much. How could you not have a legacy? Well, whatever is there is there. But, you know, a, le a legacy may be a museum. It may be a pile of books. It may be this. It may be, it may be interview. It may be all the rest of that stuff. Yes, there is some. <clears throat> But I have no uh, have no purpose to build it or to expand it. I'm just leaving. I'm leaving the planet. I love this quote that life is an, is 99% a spiritual quest, finding truth, finding serenity by being immersed in life. I, I feel that you've you've done that to your fingertips. It's been in your embodiment. Thank you. I sure have. <laughs> you 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 answered that question. You're right. And so I am really spiritually driven. And that's who I am. It's how I got where I got. But back to earlier question, who are you and how did you get there? I don't know. <clears throat> My biographer pursued that. But I am no different today, almost 90, than I was three years old. Not a bit different. I was the same. I'm the same three-year-old. Full of curiosity and life. Yeah. Fun. So for the big question, why do we send humans to space? Uh, Nance has been trying to answer that question for a long time. And you and I have had conversations about this. Uh, how do you feel about why we go? What What are your thoughts on why we go, why we should go, uh, and, and what, what that could mean for our future? I guess, uh, Rhonda, for the same reason we do anything. It's called exploration. It's called discovery. It's called open a door, see what's there. It's called, it's part of our basic nature, I think, to explore. And it's part of my basic nature since uh, <clears throat> since the age of three. I got no much, uh, not a, any better answer than that. It's called exploration. It's called curiosity. It's what's behind the door. Let's go check it out. Let's go check it out, Story. Thank you so very much for your time today. This was just a joy. You are a treasure. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for all of all that you've contributed. <clears throat>
to this world. We value you so much. Thank you so much <clears throat> and for uh, bringing me to your readership. And uh, I think we discussed around a whole bunch of lessons that you can immediately apply to your personal life. You're not sure where you're going and you just keep it moving. You take the next step and you grow from that, then discover what I got now and where I go next. So I think, uh, I thank so much for bringing me to our audience, but I think we did cover a lot of lessons uh, that they can take with them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Okay. And so now we're off to the beach. Yeah, I'm going to go run. It's addictive. It's totally addictive. <laughs>Do you have the right stuff? Then blast off to Janet's Planet Virtual Astronaut Academy. Learn from real astronauts, real pilots, real space experts, and real engineers. Welcome to Janet's Planet, where we're traveling at the speed of thought. That was a fantastic conversation. Thank you so very much, Dr. Musgrave. I really appreciate and value your time and your support of Space Matters, and I always look forward to our conversations. I would also like to thank author Rod Pyle for his insight and his continuing contributions to these conversations. I would ask that you keep in mind that you never know where life's journey is going to take you. The incremental steps that Dr. Musgrave took to get to where he is today was definitely not linear, was not a clear path. We'll see you next week on Space Matters. Bye for now.